The Albatross D5 was a single-seat biplane scout of World War I. It was the final production aircraft in the Albatross D series and the last Albatross scout to see operational service. It was also the most produced Albatross scout. It was also the most flawed and most disappointing. If you haven't watched my other two mini-documentaries about the Albatross D1, 2 and 3, I strongly recommend you pause this video, watch the presentations linked below, and then resume this one because they contain a lot of information and context that I'm not going to repeat here. Now, before tackling the subject of the D5, it will have been noticed that there is a number missing from the D series. That is the D4. It is worthwhile briefly covering this aircraft as it bridges the D3 and the D5. Idflag, Inspektion der Fliegertruppen, or Inspectorate of Flying Troops, was the bureau of the German Empire that oversaw military aviation prior to and during World War I. In November of 1916, they requested a lighter version of the D3. As such, a team of designers led by Robert Thelen developed a new aircraft with a more streamlined fuselage. Instead of the flattened ovoid of its predecessors, the new aircraft had an elliptical cross-section. Behind the pilot's head, a fairing was installed. The stabilizing fin was enlarged, and a new round-shaped rudder developed. It was powered by an experimental Mercedes engine producing 160 horsepower that was fully enclosed within the fuselage and covered by a metal cowling. Identical cord wings were restored akin to the D2 and linked by single struts. Three were ordered, but only one was produced, designated the D4. It was a dismal failure. Ground tests revealed that engine vibration was so bad as to render the aircraft literally unflyable. Replacing the two-bladed propeller with a three- and then four-bladed unit resulted in an aircraft that could at least get into the air, but the rate of climb was terrible, and though reduced, the engine vibrations produced were of sufficient strength to give concern about damage to the airframe. This was never resolved, and as a result, trials were ceased in April of 1917. However, the idea of a lightened D3 was a promising one, and so the design team basically took the improved fuselage of the D4 and combined it with the 170 horsepower Mercedes 160P engine of the D3 and the sesquiplane layout of the wings. The gap between the upper and lower wings was reduced by some 11 centimeters, and the aileron cables were rerouted through the upper wing rather than the lower. The resulting aircraft weighed 50 kilograms, or 110 pounds, less than the D3. Armament remained the same, two Maxim LMG 0815s firing through the propeller arc. In principle, this should have resulted in better maneuverability and improved performance. In practice, the top speed was increased from around 109 to 116 miles per hour, though the rate of climb was significantly less. Maneuverability is difficult to quantify compared with the D3, but it seems reasonable to state that it was not improved. Additionally, it was heavy on the controls, a trait it shared with its predecessors. This would have made it tiring to fly. Possibly because the changes were not considered substantial over the D3, Idflag did not stress test the wings, though they did test the fuselage. This was to prove a serious mistake. In April of 1917, Idflag ordered 200 D5s into production, and delivery to the field started in May. Immediately, serious problems came to light. The lower wings began to fail in flight, somewhat akin to the D3, but more frequently. Because of the routing of the aileron controls, this was somewhat survivable with a skilled pilot. Additionally, the fuselage itself proved to be rather fragile and prone to cracking upon a heavy landing, resulting in the aircraft literally breaking up. Within a month, Idflag was finally doing stress testing of the wings, and found to its dismay that the D5's wings were more prone to failure than those of the D3. 
In fact, it is suspected that more pilots were lost to structural failure than were lost in combat, but this is difficult to quantify. It is somewhat incredible that Idflag and Albatross hadn't learnt from the lessons of the D3, but it seems that they did not. At this point, Germany was in a parlous situation. The United States had declared war on April 6, 1917, which caused Germany to initiate a drastic increase in their air power. The America program called for the creation of 40 more Jagstaffeln squadrons and the aircraft to supply them. With no suitable replacements, Idflag was forced to order more Albatross D-5s despite its shortcomings. There was simply no other aircraft available. They could, I suppose, have switched back to the production of D-3s, with the improvements being implemented by OAW, but they didn't, though OAW deliveries of the D-3 were to continue until the end of 1917. A question to consider is why Albatross in Johannesthal didn't switch back to D-3 production. Instead, 400 more were ordered in May, and another 300 in July. I have not been able to find a definitive answer to this question, so I am forced to speculate. The first possibility is that Johannesthal couldn't return to D3 production. Making a fuselage like that used by the D-series requires moulds or jigs to assemble it. If those are scrapped to make room for the new production lines, then they've basically gone forever, unless investment is available to remanufacture them, which involves a delay in getting production started again. As a general sweeping statement, large manufacturing companies don't necessarily keep old manufacturing equipment because storage costs money. A second possibility is that the potential to fix the problems with the D5 were considered to outweigh the benefits of the D3. After all, if we consider the D5 to be basically a faster version of the D3, it would make sense. At the very least, pilots would end up with a slightly better aircraft, which is better than nothing, especially given the lack of an alternative. The third possibility is psychological. Basically, it's easier to move forwards than move back. Or it could be a combination of all of them. Out in the operational environment, the D-5 was not being well received. In a letter to his friend, Oberleutnant Fritz von Falkenhayn, Manfred von Richthofen, Germany's leading ace, complained of the inadequate quality as well as numbers of the aircraft he now led against the Allies over the Flanders front. He stated, The D-5 is so obsolete and so ridiculously inferior to the English that one can't do anything with the aircraft. But the people at home have not brought anything new for almost a year except this lousy albatross, and we have remained stuck with the D-3. Indeed, at the end of August 1917, albatross products made up 84% of the 1,030 scouts in the frontline inventory, with D-5 and D-3s making up the majority of that. In August 1917, the FALS D-3 and Fokker F-1 made their debut at the front. The FALS, a true biplane whose two-spar lower wing had less area than the upper, was sturdier than the Albatross, but pilots complained of sluggish performance indicative of an inferior power-to-weight ratio. Fokker's pre-production F-1 was a triplane, with an advanced cantilever wing structure. Although boasting a spectacular rate of climb and outstanding maneuverability, its production variant, the DR-1, suffered structural failures in late October and early November 1917 that were traced to poor quality control. The triplane's arrival in force was delayed while Fokker rectified the situation. In the meantime, most German pilots would have to make do with the Albatross D-5. By August of 1917, the cause of the wing problems still hadn't been determined. So as they had with the D-3, Albatross developed a patch, much as buggy software can be patched rather than redesigned. This remedy consisted of stronger wing spars, heavier ribs, additional wing support cables, and an auxiliary bracing strut at the base of the interplane strut. 
Additionally, the aileron control cables were restored to the D3 standard by rerouting them through the lower wings. The fuselage structure was reinforced by using thicker plywood. The resulting airframe was now heavier than that of the D3. Designated the D5A, performance suffered, but it-like, still in a difficult situation with the expansion of the air service brought on by the America program and the necessity to counter Allied offensives in summer and autumn, ordered the first of 1,600 more aircraft starting in August of 1917, though they didn't actually complete testing until December. The performance issue was addressed by early 1918 with the introduction of a 185 horsepower variant of the Mercedes 160P. Some of the modifications that resulted in the D5A could be and were applied to the D5s, though the fuselage would have remained potentially fragile. After all this, the end result was an aircraft that was substantially inferior to its allied opposition, though in the hands of a good pilot it could still make a decent showing. It soldiered on, in part because total production, some 2,500 units, exceeded the numbers of any other German scout until the introduction of the Fokker D7 superseded it. Production of the D5A ceased in April 1918. The following month, 131 D5 and 928 D5As were in service on the Western Front, but their numbers dwindled until by the end of August 400 Albatross of all types remained. They fought on until the armistice. Two Albatross D5A aircraft survive. One is in the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., the other is in the Australian War Memorial's Anzac Hall in Canberra.